Good morning and welcome back to the second day of the Board of Psychology meeting. Um, we had taken some things out of order and we're going to have to continue to do that to some extent in order to make the agenda work. Uh, but before we do anything else, we should establish that we have a quorum. Ms. Burns, will you be taking roll today? Papers are always more organized the first day. Okay. McCoy Badu? Good morning. Yes. <laughs> Bernal? Yes. Erickson? Present. Fu? Present. Horn? Here. Jones? Present. Phillips? Here. Here, and we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we'll be taking things somewhat out of order, but we're going to try to get a little bit back in order. We're going to start with the continuing education renewal reports, then we'll go back to policy and advocacy. Um, and at that point, I'll judge where we are in terms of time. Probably we'll go into closed session before lunch and allow other people to leave early for lunch. Um, but we will definitely be uh, finishing this morning by 11.45 for everybody that needs to still check out of the hotel. Okay. So... Let's start with the continuing education renewals reports. Ms. McCochran. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> the following statistics are as of May 30th, 2017. It's for the CE audits for January 2016 through April 2016. The CE audit overview, pass versus fail. Reasons for not passing the CE audit, January 2016 through April 2016. Citations issued for CE deficiencies and the psychologist and psychological assistant renewal applications process January 2017 through May 2017. Due to previous workload backlogs and a multi-month staff vacancy, staff is currently working on completing a backlog of 110 citations and the last completed CE audit was for the month of April 2016. A plan is currently in place to resolve the CE citations and audit backlog and resume monthly CE audits by the September board meeting. And just a quick update, the backlog as of June 14th is 89 citations left to be processed. Um, additionally, the following items were requested at the February board meeting. A report on online versus mailed-in renewals, statistics on the number of pass-fail and number of citations issued over the last three fiscal years, and statistics on the pass-fail rate for second audits. So that's for licensees who have previously failed the CE audit and are audited a second time. So due to the recent filling of the CE renewals coordinator position, the above mentioned items are not included in this CE report, but I will make sure to include them in the September board meeting. So if we go to attachment A, that's the continuing, a, continuing education audits, January 2016 through April 2016. On average, we are auditing 55 licensees a month, and about 13 of them are being issued a cite and fine. And so you will see um, on attachment C, the reasons for not passing the CE audit. Uh, the top two are their short total hours, and they are accruing the hours outside of their renewal cycle. Um, on attachment D, you'll see the citations issued for continuing education. So from January 26, 2017 through May 26, 2017, a total of 25 citations have been issued. The violation for 60% of the citations were for insufficient total hours, and of the 25 citations issued, 18 are pending compliance. And um, for the next one, attachment E, the psychologist and psychological assistant renewal applications processed, an average of 743 psychologist renewal applications were processed in the past five months 
and an average of 638 are renewing as active and 105 are renewing as inactive. And an average of 42 psychological assistant applications were processed each month. And that's it. Thank you. Um, when you say hours are outside of the cycle, mm -hmm. that means they're accrued after the cutoff occurred? Correct. Okay. And in terms of um, the chart where it shows us uh, abated versus pending abatement, does that, mean com that means complying with the citation and fine? Correct, yes. Okay, thanks. Appreciate that. Do we have any other questions or comments from the board? Excellent report. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. I'm a little concerned about the fail rate for our audits. It looks like almost one in five is failing. Um, I'm wondering whether other board members see that as a concern, whether the program is working the way we would hope. I just would guess that maybe if one in 20 failed, that would be something. But when it's one in five, I'm not sure what to make of it. Well, it, for me, it gives me pause as to what the people that are not being audited are doing. Um, I, we obviously can't do a 100% audit, but obviously a lot of our licensees, or some of our licensees, at least based on this sample, don't feel compelled to actually do their continuing education hours or aren't keeping track of whether they're keeping doing their continuing education hours. of concern to me as well. Um, I don't know if part of the issue, because I think it seems like it's gone up a little bit, so I don't know if part of the issue is that we haven't had someone in the position for a while. So if we're at April 2016, you know, I, that may be a piece of it, because usually we were around 8 to 10 percent, which I think is probably typical. And since most of them are about hours, you know, insufficient hours or hours outside of the cycle, um, that may be a piece of it. I'd like to give it a little more time personally, but watch it because that's a lot of uh, and I And I agree with you, Dr. Erickson, and everyone has spoken. I think the... Um, and, and good report, Mr. Cochran. It's great to see you back at the Board of Psychology. Oh, um, thank you. But your comment about the, the data points that we requested, I think that that one in particular over the next the last three years would be helpful information for us to look to see, is it a trend? Is there a reason to explain it some kind of way? But I do think that that's, I, if I recall correctly, that might have been the reason why that came up as a request last meeting, mm -hmm. because I think that we all did have a little bit of concern about it. But I think we'll could have a more robust conversation in September. I have, I, I have a quick question. So can our licensees go online though and document themselves their ongoing hours? Or their, you know, CE, their continuing education hours? Well, the way the system works is that you certify that you've done your hours. And then a certain proportion of the licensees, I think between five and 10%, are audited after they renew their license, and at that time they provide the documentation, or they don't provide the documentation because they don't have it. Um, but let me also say there are um, banks where people can bank their credentials. I believe CPA uh, has a credentials bank um, where if people do it and they're not going to keep track or they're not good at keeping track, people can join that bank. Okay. You know, and for a fee, I guess, a small fee or something. So there are ways for people to keep tabs if they're not good at it. Dr. Horn, though, isn't there a, wasn't there a question we had about seeing the, the, um, the utility of Breeze to be able to do some of that? Because I, 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 like, I, I feel like Jackie, um, that's not Mrs. Miss the other staff. Miss Everhart. Ever, Ever, Ever Noonan. <laughs> the married name. Everhart Noonan. 
Um, I, I know that she was mentioning about letting the licensing committee do a um, walkthrough of the breeze so we could see the functions, and maybe that's something that could be brought to the full board so we can kind of see how that is doing at a meeting. Because I feel like that came up as a question, Ms. Bernal, before okay. to see what kind of functionality we had that we weren't taking advantage of currently. Why don't I just go ahead and speak to that, actually? Um, because uh, the med board has actually put in for the option to use Breeze for the CE where it would open an application. Um, it's not an online banking where you'd put in your CE every year, um, but it is a, it would open an application, it would notify you, you can just upload all your documentation, and then the application would close and staff could process. Um, anything like that in Breeze does take a work authorization, and so it goes through this process. We've signed on with MedBoard in hopes for this option, um, but it does have to go through the Breeze team's process. They'll look at what it's going to require, how long it'll take, the cost, everything like that. And then eventually, once it's approved, we will most likely have this option available to us. It still wouldn't be a bank, as in like CPA, where it's monitoring, though. But it would allow them to upload it with their renewals. So that's when they would upload it. It'd be one. It'd be once every two years, basically. And I don't know if it'd be once every two years or once the application is opened. So we'd have to follow along to see how they're going to do that function-wise. Yeah, be a good thing to bring back anyway. So absolutely, as an option. Yeah. It usually takes a while. Is all I'm getting at. So it may not have an update by September. So. But I do think that, you know, I think it could be discussed at the licensing committee, but I think the full board, like we talked yesterday about letters being sent so we could understand what is what the interface a licensee or an applicant has would be helpful. And I know that Ms. Everhart, Ms. Noonan had offered to do that with people individually when they were in Sacramento to do a walkthrough. And maybe that is something that if we could figure out a way to do that as a part of a board meeting, it might allow us to have a good conversation and maybe help staff, you know, figure out what that request would look like like uh, Ms. Burns, if that's something we wanted to pursue or something, it might be helpful. I'm, I'm oh, thank you. Um, so out of, so I've done 50 citations so far and I've only received one. Okay. Well, that's reassuring. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In any event. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions from the board? Any comments from the public? Well, thank you very much. And as uh, Ms. Jones said, welcome back to the Board of Psychology. We're happy to have you back. Thank you. Paper, paper, paper. Um, so we're now going to return to uh, the agenda for the Policy and Advocacy Committee. And uh, in that regard, I'll turn it over to Ms. Jones. Uh, again, good morning, everyone. Uh, we left off yesterday at um, item 12, 12B3 XX. And so we'll do that, then we'll go back to the items that we skipped. But I know that um, as we were concluding the policy and advocacy report yesterday, there was comments about SB 755. I know that Dr. Jolinder Crow and Ms. Burns um, had several folks that were con contacting in, Mr. Glassbeagle and Ms. Levy, about updates on SB 755. And I know that we wanted to have a chance as a board to review the hand carry given the conversation. So I, I don't know um, if it's out of order to ask maybe Ms. Burns to give us another overview of that so we can continue the discussion. So we were informed also that there were up, uh, updates, amendments yesterday um, to the bill. So we are going to be passing those out. So um, SB 755, again, would... Um, would clarify and limit the mental examination of a child that is less than 15 years of age and has credible evidence of being sexually abused to psychological testing of no more than three hours, including breaks, unless the court grants an extension for good cause. It also had the provision that referenced the evidence code 
the amendments that are being passed out to you now that were adopt or were put into the bill yesterday, um, it removes that and has that a license. It is. If an action involves allegations of sexual abuse of a minor, including any act in paragraphs 1 to 3 inclusive of subdivision A of section 1002, and the examinee is less than 15 years of age, the licensed physician or clinical psychologist shall have expertise in child abuse and trauma. So it removed the reference to the evidence code that we were concerned about. Um, and it does keep the three hours um, inclusive of breaks. Um, with the ability for the court to grant the uh, extension. We've also provided you with the author's fact sheet. And in talking with the author's office, the three hours was decided for them as a reasonable threshold based on um, experiences currently. Judges typically agree to two to four hours, which is why the three hours was chosen. Additionally, uh, the attorneys of abuse victims have observed that exams longer than three hours are extremely difficult for children under the age of 14, and they cause additional trauma, um, and that there is emotional reaction if subjected to a longer examination and without breaks. So that was their reasoning for the three hours. Um, thank you, Ms. Burns. Um, so I, I, I know that where we left off yesterday, um, see what those get says. Um, where we left off yesterday, the conversation was, do we um, want to take a position, oppose or oppose unless amended, but more importantly, there was also the conversation that staff had had limited conversations and, and interaction with the author's office uh, on this matter, and initially the motion that was helped that was crafted by Ms. Sorek to help us move us along was to do oppose unless amended directing delegation staff of changes to our, I forget what it's called, but the legislative body herself, um, this president and the chair of the policy and advocacy committee per our, our rules um, because we were concerned that the next time we would meet would be in August at our um, proposed teleconference with that data still being worked upon. So I hope I accurately kind of summarize where we were at. I don't know where people, I think we were trying to figure out would it be opposed or opposed unless amended. And um, I think that some of these amendments that you shared this morning might color our conversation a little different than it did yesterday. So board, what say you? <laughs> um, I, you know, if I felt relatively strongly about this bill, given the incorporation of the evidence code section that it would allow any licensed psychotherapist no matter what the licensing category was, to be able to do these examinations when this is really the purview of psychologists and psychiatrists. So I, I feel like the primary issue I had with the legislation has been resolved. Um, the three-hour limitation, uh, I understand the California Psychological Association was able to negotiate to include in the bill discretion on the part of the judge to extend the number of hours. Um, I don't think it's the greatest solution. I, I would prefer for the examiner uh, who is subject to licensing complaints if they do something inappropriate to make that determination themselves. On the other hand, I certainly understand why the author is concerned about children who find themselves in this situation where they've been abused and uh, maybe traumatized by the process of going through the testing. Uh, although, as Dr. Horn pointed out, uh, a good psychologist would be able to largely uh, ameliorate some of that by uh, the way they handled the testing situation. So I, I don't feel like the bill's ideal. I don't know that we need to take a strong or any position on it necessarily. And, and before we hear other comments, the other part I failed to mention is initially the staff recommendation was to watch it and to have staff go ahead. So I guess there's a couple of things on the table. Uh, any other thoughts? So I'm going to disagree with you. I do think it's better now that it's just psychologists and physicians, but I am concerned about this limitation on an area of our expertise. Um, as I read actually what's included there now, I do think it's interesting. It might be the way I read it. It can be a licensed physician or a psychologist, licensed clinical psychologist who's had five years experience diagnosing and assessing. I'm sorry? It has the expertise in child abuse right. and trauma. Right. Um, so, I mean, there are several things I, 
I think are concerning to me. Uh, and, uh, but per particularly the, the piece that I still don't like is the restriction, again, on, from someone who's not a clinical person. If this has been abused, then I think that those people who have abused this, I can't imagine ever give, going over three hours or even three hours, by the way, without giving a break to somebody I'm assessing if it's needed. I mean, that to me is just, I mean, it's unethical, it's below the standard of care. I mean, it's everything. So these assessors should be complained about. And I, I think this is a dangerous slope to allow courts to say, you are limited in what you can do. We're taking away your judgment about what's needed here and making a decision about it. And I think that's dangerous. So I'm, I would like to, I don't know, maybe y'all can talk to them. Maybe they'll change <laughs> their mind some. But I, I, I want to say oppose unless amended. I, I just don't think the, the courts should, uh, someone who doesn't have training in this should not, not make that decision. That's where I am. I, I tend to agree with you, Dr. Phillips. I'm pleased that it's physician and licensed psychologist. And the uh, part about experience in child abuse and trauma applies to both physicians and psychologists, fortunately. Does so it? It does. That's according not to how I read it. Look at paragraph two on the um, That's what I'm reading. Doesn't that mean both? Yes. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. So yeah, I'm, that's fine. I'm satisfied with that. Uh, uh, the three-hour limitation, I, a little bit, I agree with the concerns about that. Probably the point is, though, is that some, I don't know if there were psychologists, but some licensed professionals have abused this, um, not showing good judgment, and this would be an effort to um, reduce that abuse. Uh, I'm, I'm generally okay with the bill as amended. A question I have is whether the plaintiff examiner is allowed to do as many hours as they wish. Do we know whether that's been spoken to? The, the defense examiner would be the one who's trying to help the person or the employer who's being charged with something. So they maybe have been overly zealous in how many hours trying to disprove the allegation, but the plaintiff the psychologist and the attorney representing the um, young person who's been abused, do they have a limit on how long they can perform a psychological evaluation? Well, Mr. Fu, are you thinking yes? I think the bill is written, says any party may obtain discovery, so that would suggest both the defendant and the plaintiff would be limited to the three hours um, with the discretion for the judge to extend. And I think the context setting, again, it's, it's very narrow. It's in the civil discovery process. It's certainly not in every situation. Um, and so that would be the context for the bill. It's good to hear. Glad to know that we don't give one side free reign and limit the other. Well, even so. Uh, Dr. Horn, I mean, one second. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Ms. Oh, Marks. I'm sorry. Just as you're discussing the language of the bill, I wanted to point out a couple things that you might want to think about. This is probably more for the med board, but it says shall be performed only by a licensed physician. I believe the license type is called physician and surgeon. And it, then it says all by a licensed clinical psychologist. The board doesn't issue specific licenses. It only issues a license as a psychologist, and I wouldn't want there to be confusion about whether or not somebody was specifically licensed as a clinical psychologist. Um, I think it could be uh, you know, made more specific by a, 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 license, a psychologist licensed by, the, by this board or something along those lines. And then it says has had at least five years of postgraduate experience, which could include the, a year of SPE. And so I just want to point that out, and if that's okay with the board, um, 
Yeah, but I wanted to point that out in case you wanted to discuss that. My thought is, if we are going to take a position that we don't like the three-hour limitation, then basically we're opposing the bill, mm -hmm. right? So, it, so if we're going to do that, I don't think it's opposed unless amended. I don't think we can chat with them about it and ask well, them to take true. that part out. Mm -hmm. um, so, or unless we're going to expand the number of hours, perhaps. But um, I, I understand Dr. Horn's reservations. I still feel. Much more comfortable with the bill. Well, I'm going to go obviously with the, you know, if the, if I'm not in the majority, I'm <laughs> obviously I support what the board decides. I'm just telling you these are my concerns. I think it's potentially a slippery slope. I understand the the reasoning behind it. Again, I feel if somebody is abusing this process. Uh, if we've got a biased psychologist or physician who's doing an evaluation, that person ought to be complained against, you know. And I don't think saying, okay, you only have this amount of time helps us do our job. I don't think that's necessarily protective of the public to restrict the amount of time. If you have somebody who would have abused that time anyway. That, you know, that's kind of where I get so, but I, I've said my piece. I'm not going <laughs> to. Thank you, Dr. Horn. Does anyone else have any comments they want to add on this? Yes, I happen to agree with Dr. Horn on that. I don't think that courts should be allowed to, to make that kind of decision in this level of expertise. So I do agree with you on that. So um, I guess um, before we have public comment, which we of course will have, um, I don't know if anyone would like to make a motion on where they stand or anyone else wants to share. I, I feel like um, Dr. Phillips and Dr. Erickson, I feel comfortable with the move to, to say we watch and have staff share that thought. But uh, again, uh, who you know, we need to take a motion and we can go ahead, Mr. Fu. May I ask a question real quickly? Um, so can we? <laughs> can we, uh, just for a context setting, can, can we explain what civil discovery is? Maybe that might be helpful as well in terms of uh, what process civil discovery is happening, um, what is the context for civil discovery, and so that might be, and I'm, um, I understand. Well, well maybe, I mean, we all might not. exactly, and so that might be helpful in the context setting of how this bill would be applicable perhaps. I'm not familiar with these kinds of cases. I mean, civil discovery is the, the, the process by which during the course of a civil lawsuit that either side gets, uh, seeks evidence to support its, um, its position. These cases, I, I, I'm not entirely sure the context of these particular cases. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the, the licensed members may have more experience. And my understanding is that typically in these cases it involves uh, families trying to recover the costs that they've incurred relative to physical treatment or emotional treatment for the child or any ongoing uh, emotional suffering on their part that could be expected to affect them for the rest of their life. But it's typically when they're seeking damages against the perpetrator. Um, oftentimes the perpetrator has homeowner's insurance which may or may not cover their actions. So. Um, I just wanted to say I agree with with Ms. Jones, Dr. Phillips, and Dr. Erickson. And just only because, again, as we you know talk about our role is to protect the consumer as well, and this is obviously related to children. That's just where I feel that I'm in support of watch, of just watching. So, Ms. Bernal or someone, is that a motion? Um, and, and let me go back. To, let me go back to since you said that. Uh, but Mr. Fu, does that does that give you enough information? And I do think that on this background, thank you um, again, staff, Mr. Glassbeagle, um, for making the con contact with the author's office to get these documents because I do think that that is what Dr. Phillips described is here in the background in the last paragraph, and so it kind of gives more context. But I do think that um, you know. Any case, either way, no matter which way we make a, a position or not, I, I think that staff will continue to. Um, currently, it's been on our watch list, and staff will be able to take some of these questions back. I'm assuming, but um, is there a motion? Um, I guess if it's a watch, there is no need to a motion. Um, but is there a motion to take a position? Um, 
and to take any action on this item. I, I will move it in its motion to watch. I was wrong, and I was wrong. We don't need to have a motion for that um, because it's already on the watch list. So my misunderstanding, and excuse me for calling you out to encourage you to do that. Um, you uh, asked uh, me to step uh, up. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, we are a great team here on the Board of Psychology. Um, so um, is there any other board comment about this before we open it for a public? Sure, Dr. I, I just want to ask a question. Let's, uh, let's say we watch it. I mean, I've expressed my concerns, but I know that I'm – not in the majority, nor are you, but thank you. No, I just thank you for your support. Uh, no, seriously. Um, if, if we watch it, I know this is going to come up before we meet again. Um, what if something happens? I can't imagine. Let's say it goes through now. They've made this, the, they've changed the, well, I could move the other and just see. Um, partly what I'm saying is what if something happens that concerns us along the way before this gets, before we have our next meeting? Well, let me just say this, and, and, I, and I'm sure staff might have a different perspective, perhaps. Everything on the watch list, if, if any of them change drastically, we're in the same situation. And so um, it would fall in the category currently with the watch. They would continue to watch it. And as you know, um, Mr. Glasspiegel or Ms. Burns send us weekly updates. Right. And, you know, as, we, as the, um, the timetable gets closer, I think this has happened last year or the year before. We called a special meeting for right. some things. So I think that would be the action we would take. But maybe staff have a different um, idea of what would happen. Yep, that's exactly what would happen. We monitor all our watch bills, any amendments that get taken. We watch in committee. And then if we think or worry that anything might concern the board, we can bring it up to Antoinette, Dr. Phillips, and uh, Ms. Jones, and that way we can discuss is it time to call a special meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and then we could call that or use any delegated authority if that's acceptable as well. So. And let me also add, too, because I know that I think we have a scheduling possible issue, but we also have a policy and advocacy committee scheduled in J July. It's July. That's been canceled. So it has been canceled. I wasn't sure. It's still on the list. So I wasn't sure if we were going to try to reschedule that or not, but in any case, we're not. So in um, any case, that's what we would okay. do. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, so also I would just like to make a statement. I know we're going to have public comment, but if if there are any of these supporters of this bill who've been watching our meeting by any chance, or if we could educate people, I would really encourage if people are seeing abuses by psychologists of this uh, evaluation process, I hope that they bring those concerns to the board. That's what I want to say. Thank you, Dr. Horn. Is there any public comment about SB7? Oh, sorry, Ms. Sirk. Um, another possible, I'm just going to throw this out there um, because I, I see this as a, a real concern um, that's, that's being relayed from Dr. Horn. If the board did not feel like it wanted to take a position but wanted to relay a message about the bill, about the current consumer protections that the board has in place, Without taking a position, we can communicate with the sponsor of the bill and the other's office about what the current complaint process is and... And perhaps the use of, the, the use of licensed clinical psychologists mm -hmm. as opposed to licensed psychologists. Mm -hmm. I'd really feel good about that because, I mean, well, for the reasons I've stated. So thank you for offering that. Yeah. And, and I would say, we'll get to public comment in one moment. Um, and I will just say this also. I think that um, much like yesterday's conversation, I think when we feel that as, as through policy and advocacy, when we see issues coming up, I think that you're exactly right for us to alert folks about the process. And maybe that will allow us to tailor some of our social media outreach and our newsletter to utilize those opportunities so that we are fully educating people when this kind of, these kind of items come up and we see some trends. So I think that would be important. Ms. Jones, I don't know if we need a motion, um, but if uh, we do, and I'll look to uh, Ms. Marks, um, it would be uh, helpful to have a 
motion from the board to delegate, maybe delegate staff to work with Dr. Horn on uh, sending a letter to the author and the sponsor of the bill um, covering the issues and the concerns that were reflected in the discussion today without a official position um, from the board. We can always do a letter of concern instead of a position letter. And I, I would like to say yes, yeah, because I know that this came up initially in our policy and advocacy committee meeting, so I would think that I would like to say that the advocacy, policy and advocacy committee, too, to be a part of that, because I know that okay. Dr. Erickson um, also initially highlighted this issue and raised it up outside of the watch status and gave them questions to think of. Not a bad idea for the, f to have a motion because it's, it's, it is a delegating to the staff to um, relay the position of the board, whether or not that's a position, a specific uh, pose or support position on the bill. It is the position of the board. Before we take that motion, Ms. Bernal, I think you were trying, to, were you trying to get in to say something? Oh, no, I was just thanking you for a, 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 an idea for an article. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> Will we be able to look at the letter before it officially goes out as an entire board? Not for comments, but just for FYI. Can we send it to the full, well, can you make the motion that includes that? Um, I'd like to move that. Uh, we have staff uh, along with my input develop a letter that just expresses our concerns uh, about this bill and that after that letter is finished, <laughs> drafted, thank you, the, it goes to the Policy and Advocacy Committee for a final approval and uh, that it also be, just be made available to the board to read it. Yeah. But no input. <laughs> Second. No, you, you can, if you want to make, go ahead. No, I didn't want to add to it. I just wanted to be actually there. Do we want it to go to the, um, the policy and advocacy committee? Um, will they be involved in the process? That's of, what she included in the motion. Did you say that they will be involved in the process yeah. of right constructing the letter? They will okay the letter. See, that's what I thought she said. I'm, I'm asking, should they be involved in actually um, be part of constructing? Well, I think I think it, I, th I think it's sufficient that as is. I think that as long as it comes through and we can add to it, that I think that yeah, they will be if because they get final approval. I just so want to clarify: you're not talking about through. having it be a committee committee work because we don't want to violate open meetings right. act. So yeah. um, share with committee members. It, it will members. not be, it, unless you notice as as a committee meeting. It can't be a it can't be committee input. Right. Well, there are only two members on the policy and that. Oh, it's a. What committee are you on, Salem? We're only licensing. Licensing. Well, not officially yet. That's probably going to happen today. There's a vacancy. Ah. Uh, okay. So, well, I, I would like the. I think the chair certainly ought to. Yeah. Well, well, let's say this, um, and also, I, I, so this is the, so I, I do have a friendly amendment to offer. I think that we want to be very specific about the two issues. It's about licensed clinical psychologists, and it's also about the, um, the I'm sorry? Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, education of the complaints process and encouraging um, the sponsors think to include Actually, that. yeah, oh. but I wasn't going to say that. I was going to say um, basically the process by which we, the, the, the licensed like, psychologists do their work and then limiting their abilities. So I think that I just want to make sure that we're very specific as opposed to issues with the bill. I right. want to make sure that we got that on record for staff. It's those two primary issues. And I do think it's important to include what Mr. Fu added also, right. the issue of, um, of communicating the process for complaints. Is that so a... It's, so it's, we're really talking about three things. Right. Educating to the process of complaints. No, 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 no. The issue with the bill are those two things, but then also explaining what the process is. That's different than the, the bill language. Well, I think it goes to the substance of the bill. I think that's why you wanted it brought to their attention, that they really don't need this bill, that there's already an alternative right. mechanism for doing right. it. So I do think it's an issue with the bill. But, I mean, I don't care how you language it, but, but I do think it's important that we know that all three of those topics need to be covered. 
That's fine. So those are the three amendments that I'd like to offer. <laughs> And that it goes for final approval after the, the staff and I have worked together on it to the chair. So this is the thing. I, I actually feel like I heard something differently. So maybe we start over with the motion because I feel like Mr. Fu said he wanted to see it, the whole board. So are, can, we, can the whole board sign off on it like we no. do? Let me ask the question to Ms. Marks. <laughs> Uh, Ms. Marks, can the full board, like when we do let responses to uh, enforcement cases and there is a, you know, if we're sending anything out and you give us an opportunity to review it all as a board, can we do the same thing in this case or would that be a violation of open meeting um, act? When you're looking at discipline, uh, to disciplinary matters, there is a specific provision in the Administrative Procedure Act that allows mail ballots for that. There is no provision for a mail ballot for this kind of matter. You could all communicate with the executive officer. I just want to be really careful about there not being committee approval unless there's been a committee meeting to, to look at that and um, give your approval. There can be individual approval that you relay to uh, Ms. Sorek as long as you don't create a situation where she's having to talk with everyone about everyone else's concerns because then you will get into open meetings at violation. So we could blind copy it to everyone and people if they have changes they could send it to to the um, to Ms. Ork. I'm asking Ms. Marks please because no, I'm trying to get a question. No, you, you could individually send your comments to Ms. Ork. That's it. I, I, just, okay. I just think this process is becoming incredibly unwieldy. It's going to take a month to draft this letter. I think I feel comfortable that um, you assisting staff, Dr. Horner assisting staff with um, drafting and you reviewing it is sufficient and we can get a copy of the letter after it's been sent out. That's what my preference would be because otherwise I think we get caught up in a process and we're waiting for people to respond back. So uh, yeah, I just think it becomes unwieldy for staff. Well, I just wanted to make sure I was hearing everyone because Mr. Fu asked that question. So I just wanted to make sure that we, we address what the issue was at hand. And so it seems like we all are nodding by consensus that we would do that process. And this person that seconded the motion, are you comfortable with that friendly amendment to add the three issues specifically as Dr. Phillips articulated? Dr. Phillips, and she jumped in there. I hope I can remember. Uh, the first issue is the use of the phrase licensed clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. What was the second issue? You said well, no, that's the third. Actually, let me try to do it. I had to start Sorry. again. Dr. Phillips jumped in on me. <laughs> licensed, psych licensed clinical psychologist, the issue of the practice of psychology and limiting the, the ability for psychologists to do their work. And third was the complaint process. Thank you. <laughs> and these are. We're uh, uh, continuing on watch position. These are concerns we're going to convey in a letter to the uh, author of the bill. My the sponsor. The sponsor. I'm fine the with sponsor. that. My, my second is fine with that as well. Thanks. And, and Dr. Erickson, I only ask you uh, this way because mm -hmm. if, in lieu of me, if you felt like you wanted to be the person on the policy and advocacy committee to be the person to review it, I'd be okay with that because I know this was an issue that you initially brought to the committee. So it, it's up to you or I could do it if you feel comfortable that way, whichever you'd prefer. I'm fine with you doing it. I think it'll be just fine. Okay. So we have that motion on the floor. Yes, Ms. Burns? I, I just want to clarify because we do want to bring up any amendments is going rather fast through the process. But since you're approving that letter of concern, that we can just go ahead and tell the author we have a technical concern about the use of clinical psychologists before the drafting of the letter. We can just make a phone call real quick in case this moves really quickly to let them know that just so you know, technical assistance here, we don't have a licensed clinical psychologist. We have a licensed psychologist. I would even say you could even say all three things that a letter is forthcoming just okay. to be able because it's moving fast. Perfect. That okay. once, if, if, if that motion should pass, I feel like staff have the ability to communicate Perfect. our concerns. All right. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure. Got it. Um, any other board comment about that motion? Is there any public comment? I know, Dr. Schaefer, you had your hand up. Please come forward. Did I say Dr. Schaefer? Did I say Ms. Schaefer? I thought I said Dr. Schaefer. You did say Dr. Schaefer. 
So, so sorry. Dr. Schaefer, it's good to see you. <laughs> good to see you, too. Dr. Schaefer, Division Two of CPA. Uh, I wanted to first ask if you know who sponsored the bill. Consumer attorneys. The consumer attorneys. I think it's on the sheet of paper. Um, do, do, we, do we have extra copies of what was handed out to the board to share with the public, members of the public? They are on the back. It will now be grabbed. Oh, okay. Sure. No, no, no. You're the one handing Well, my concern is um, multifold. One is, and I think it was brought up indirectly, is having uh, reactionary positions based on a few that formulate a complaint to stimulate legislation that basically impacts the scope of practice of psychologists without truly vetting psychologists in the broad sense that conduct such evaluations to get a better education on just what is entailed. I don't know how many of the board members or psychologists do child abuse evaluations or have ever been engaged in that process. I have over 30 years of working in child abuse and neglect, even more than that, but you know, let's keep it at that because it just means I'm old and I've worked a lot. Uh, so my concern is we, someone can purport anything in a platform if they have an agenda, but I'm, I'm not hearing what data they have to support it. We don't have anything that suggests that this is a rigorous outlier or two in terms of the broad field of psychologists throughout California. Uh, and we know that legislating, uh, trying to use legislation like this to control behavior doesn't always work. As the board just reviewed this morning of, of vetting compliance with CEs and finding the high percentage not complying with something so simple. And this is much more complex. I understand the concept of protecting the consumer, but I think that maybe the um, slant at which we're looking at, or the way the board discussed protecting consumer may not be looking at it through the lens I would. I would say the issue is we're not, cons we're not protecting the consumer, the child. When you're looking, when you're working with children that have been abused and you're trying to do an evaluation, Part of your due diligence, if you're properly trained, and I've trained hundreds of psychologists now, hopefully licensed and doing the right thing over the years, hopefully they are well equipped in their technique to understand the importance of timing and metering out the process uh, in respect to the child's needs. So moving quickly can be injurious to the child. You typically don't do one of these evaluations in one session for in service of the child. Uh, so now you, if you are going to do it correctly and you don't want to exhaust the child, you want to take time to build the relationship with the child so that you create a safe place, so that they are comfortable with you, that all takes time. Three hours to me is really uh, unacceptable. Also, what we may end up doing by supporting this kind of a bill is creating a situation where psychologists uh, limit what they typically would do or maybe some of what would be truly necessary to get a true diagnostic picture because now there's a fear factor that they're bumping against a three-hour window, which is the antithesis of consumer care in service of the child's needs. That all concerns me. Uh, we have a complaint process within the Board of Psychology and in the event that someone has uh, conducted some untoward behavior in the evaluation of a child, then any consumer has the ability to make a complaint to the Board and that could be truly vetted and examined in a case-by-case -case basis. But a broad brushstroke ruling such as this this, as Dr. Horn suggested, I, I agree completely, this is a slippery slope where interest groups supported by a few that are not happy with something specific or looking for monetary remuneration or have some secondary gain that truly is not even attached to the true clinical issue, start to rule the day in terms of what psychologists are going to be able to do effectively within our profession. Uh, we already have a problem with psychologists because of the few 
the parents that make a complaint, well, not so few, parents that make a complaint on child custody evaluations that they didn't get what they wanted in terms of their evaluation of themselves as a parent coming forth and making complaints, which has driven many of my colleagues to state they will never do an evaluation of child custody because of that. So I, I encourage the board to please think of all these factors. I truly think this is an unhealthy bill for the si reasons stated and for the protection of the child. And I would encourage the board to speak to a good group of psychologists across the state that conduct these evaluations to get feedback rather than perhaps being pushed to take a reactionary position to go ahead and uh, uh, make, take a watch. Taking a watch, I think, in this position is that the bill is going to move forward. And I think it may be a time to kind of, um, pardon my expression, but to be brave and make a stance for what we know is right, at least from my perspective. And hopefully I've encouraged you to think similarly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaver, Ms. Bernal, and then Mr. Food. Oh, hi. I just have a question just for clarification. Dr. Shaver, thank you. I appreciate your comments, and especially about psychologists bonding with children and how important that is. But isn't this more specific to the psychological, the psych exams during the um, court proceedings? Right? It's specific to that. It's not previous. It's, it's not part of the treatment. It's okay. when you bring an expert in to do the evaluation. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Bernal, Mr. Fu? Uh, oh. Clarification, have, have your comments been communicated to the author's office or, or, has the, or has CPA conveyed that position to the author's office in an official opposed letter or a concern letter? Uh, CPA has conveyed it, but uh, okay. CPA has only Uh, Joe, Dr. Joe Lindercrow from the California Psychological Association. Our process um, is that our board of directors is responsible for uh, setting legislative positions on our positions on pieces of legislation. Our board did consider this bill. As I said yesterday, um, the board was concerned about the three-hour limitation and so worked with the author's office to um, get that language that is the qualifying language that allows the court to extend the time with good cause. And CPA uh, now has a neutral position on the bill and has communicated that to the author's office. Thank you, Dr. Linder Crow. Any other public comment about SB 755? Hearing none, is there any more board comment about, um, yes, Dr. Erickson. Frankly, I was troubled as I listened to Dr. Schaefer uh, uh, thinking of some of the factors that may uh, be the, the run-up to this current uh, proposed legislation. Um, do we really have any data how often this has occurred? I, I don't think so. Uh, do we know whether it was a psychologist? Uh, in some cases, we don't know that. Uh, is this based on a few people that are unhappy with how a process went with their child and have complained and um, there is a place for complaining and people speaking up but is that enough for legislation are we are we doing something we is is the author and the state if this becomes law uh, adopting a position that perhaps would be um, in the larger picture reactionary to a uh, a small problem so I'm I'm troubled and I wonder if we should reconsider a, an opposed um, position at this point. Um, and, and before we get to that point, we'll have to take out this motion, but I do think that, um, I think you raise up good questions and I think that was part of the, um, the uh, matter that the staff brought to our attention. A lot of that detail has not been communicated. There's not been a conversation in detail with the author's office. Um, so I think that um, while we laid out the three issues in this motion, I think that some of that other information I'm sure would be something that we might be able to get back as well. Mr. Fu? 
and, and for context, I think we've heard some of these discussions of who's supporting the bill. And just for clarification, based at least on the committee analysis, it includes the Children's Advocacy Institute, Children Now, Crime Victims United of California, Disability Rights of California, Keep Kids Safe. So I, I just want to put that into context as we make this discussion. Um, thank you, Mr. Fu. Um, Dr. Horn. So uh, again, I, I want to say that Dr. Schaefer actually, I think, communicated more eloquently than I did uh, my concerns. Um, anyway, I don't know if, if I should withdraw my motion or, but I, I guess I'm satisfied, well, uh, I, honestly, I'm struggling here because I have those concerns You've also said, Dr. Erickson, that that raises your concerns to a different level. Ms. Aquabadu, you've. I was aware of this. I was when I first when I first heard it, and as I was reading that, because we are allowing the courts. I think while it, I know it's an assessment. Is that what you're to my oh yes, I know they are assessing at that point, but still. Uh, uh, based on what you've shared and what Dr. Schaefer shared, you're still interacting with the child. And we are allowing the courts to, in some way, frame what uh, psychologists do in when you're dealing with human beings and you can't regulate it um, to that extent that this will happen at this time. That was my concern when I was See, there. I don't and think it's this still is my concern. One second, Dr. Horn. Oh, yeah, no. of course. And it's still my concern that we're kind of so. So I, 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 I know Dr. Horn, you have something to say, but Dr. Phillips, I have something to say before Dr. Phillips speaks also. And so I, I think that, um, Dr. Schaefer, I appreciate your comments as well. I do think that I also appreciate Dr. Joe Linder Crow's comments. And I think that there is an opportunity, if more time is needed, that that can be granted. And so I actually appreciate Mr. Fu's com comment about who is supporting this bill and the issue about who is being served. I think that without going back through what was on the agenda yesterday, I think the level of fear and the level of um, challenge that was raised in some of those conversations has to also be considered in this conversation. And so I actually do feel comfortable personally with the way it's written. And I feel that um, I do think that I trust staff to take the three issues that were identified. But I don't feel as though um, we need to take an opposition position, and particularly given who's supporting of this, as well as the fact that CPA has a neutral position. So I feel like I think that it is important for us to to raise these issues and not be reactionary, but I do think that we've got to keep in mind about consumers and the fact that this is civil, not a criminal discovery. And the issue is, is that basically that um, we need to ensure that, I mean, there is that assurance that if more time is needed, the, the court can consider that and make the, grant the exception. I also want to put this in context. We're talking about an expert acting in a court proceeding. It's not unusual for the court to have limitations on what an expert can do or not do. And I understand that we're concerned, and I, this is, was my original concern when I first heard about the bill, and uh, the decision was made to bring this to the board as a whole. Um, it, it's, it's, it's part of the tariff of being, wanting to be an expert in a proceeding. It may create some problems around discretion, uh, uh, around the discretion to be able to do more testing, but there's also an opportunity for somebody to go into court and for good cause to show it. I don't think if if what somebody explained uh, that they wanted to do this more slowly, that they needed to do it over multiple sessions, I, I don't think courts would unnecessarily um, prevent that from happening. We don't know the data. Perhaps the author's office does know the data. So rather than assume that there is no data driving this decision or that the, this is just a reactionary action, I really actually think I would prefer for the letter to take place, for the letter to be sent, and for staff to be in communication with the office office to see what the database is and, and rather than uh, take a position that, that they don't know what they're doing. Um, because I think it's unfair to the legislature that brought, legislator that brought this forward. And I will say that, um, Senator Beal has been incredibly supportive 
of mental health concerns in the past. Um, he's been a great advocate on behalf of uh, patients in the mental health treatment context, and, and I have the greatest respect for him, so I don't think he does these things um, in the absence of real consideration. This is his area of interest. So, uh, Ms. Bernal, I was just going to add, I just want to really say, that Ms. Jones, thank you so much for what you said, and I'm in complete agreement with how you phrased it. Thank you. Dr. Hart? So I'm just going to say one thing, and then I'll be quiet. I see it as a pu public protection issue also. I'm not saying anything about <coughs> Senator Beal or anything else. I see it as a public protection issue. Um, but I do take what you just said, uh, Dr. Phillips, that if psychologists do have the ability, will have the ability to go and say, you know, this is how I work or this is uh, what I want to do and can ask the court for that, and I think courts are reasonable um, about that. So I don't think maybe that limit necessarily has to be hard and fast and, and uh, that the court wouldn't understand altering the process. So that's helpful to me in seeing that, because I see it completely as a public protection issue, and that's helpful to me is seeing, okay, this, the public can still be served. That's always my concern, so. Thank you, Dr. Horn, and yeah. I feel like that came across in Dr. Linder Crow's comments about the work that uh, Ms. Levy and the CPA staff have done to try to encourage judicial discretion, and I see her nodding my head, her head, so I think that I did ca capture that accurately. Dr. Erickson, or I thought I saw you reaching for your mic. Am I, were you? I'm sorry. I, I think I'd like to clarify the letter uh, that we plan to write will convey a neutral position or we don't have to say anything about our position. It will be no position. It'll just be a letter of concern um, laying out the three issues that were identified today. Thank you. Any other comments, discussion? Hearing none, um, Ms. Burns, can you call the roll on that motion? motion the motion that's in the letter, letter identifying the three issues and having staff take that information to the author's office. Absolutely. Equibidu? Yes. Bernal? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Who? Aye. Horn? Aye. Jones? Aye. Phillips? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, so we're going to take the other item and we'll finish at the watch section. The other item that staff brought to our attention um, is ZZ, and that is ACR8. That stands for Assembly. Um, what is the C? The resolution. Concurrent resolution. The C wasn't coming to me. Um, and this was a. Oh, let me get to my page. So this, um, this item, did everyone find it in the notebook? It's 12B3ZZ. It's with your hand carry packet. And it's actually part of the hand carry. Does everyone have it or no? Can, can staff um, get a copy for Dr. Horn, please? Um, so this was the this was, this matter was discussed in great detail at both the policy and advocacy committee, and you will also recall at our April twenty first teleconference meeting, and this is the. Um, concurrent uh, um, assembly concurrent resolution eight which is a measure that would recognize adverse childhood experiences also known as post-traumatic street disorder in communities of color as a mental health condition with growing implications for our state and um, more importantly um, i'm going to turn it over to miss burns to go into any other detail um, that is happening on this or any updates 
on this, on this item, but more importantly, as she's saying her comments, it would be important to explain what a concurrent resolution is, um, as opposed to a bill, as well as the fact that I know the discussions that came up in our meeting, Dr. Erickson and I were discussing the notion of would this type of a, a resolution create a new diagnosis category, and that was a concern um, as well. So, um, I, and I know there's some public comment on this one, so we'll get to that as well, but if you could just give us, lay out everything I've missed, Ms. Burns, please. So it's a concurrent resolution as in it's not a piece of statute that goes into the code that's enforced by any uh, um, state agencies or authorities, so it's not going to require anyone to reimburse for such diagnoses. It doesn't put it in a diagnosis manual. The author said that wasn't their intent. Um, and they are currently, um, according to the author, working with interested partners and opposition on amendments and that they will be coming out in the next couple weeks. Um, that was all the update I got from them. So they are working with those that are interested in the bill on amendments. Um, I believe others that are here today can speak to that. Um, and then again, of course, this doesn't put it in any diagnosis manual. It does not um, put it in any statutory reference that we would be enforcing. It is a resolution to bring awareness to the issue. Is that's how it's been communicated to us from the author. And um, at this time, this would stay. There's no recommendation from staff to take a position on this. It is to continue to watch the, the bill. Um, and so that is the recommendation from staff to us as a full board um, from our August or from our April 21st meeting. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments about ACR 8? Dr. Horn? So we are communicating the the particular concerns, we we have communicated those kinds of concerns, and it sounds like this is the concerns that we raised previously. So right now, this is just, it's a resolution. It's to bring awareness to the problem. It's a, um, a diagnosis, and I'm going to put that in quotes, that was sort of created, or a term, I, I'll say it's not a diagnosis, it's a term that was created just so uh, to bring awareness to the problem. That's that's what it is. And since we didn't come to any sort of official position, we haven't relayed those concerns. Okay. We do know that um, others have relayed their concerns. Okay. Yeah, and, and I would say I think that, yes, as Ms. Burns says, my understanding is we've not relayed concerns, but as questions have been raised, staff have gone back to get more answers so that, that we could be educated on what was happening at both the committee level as well as the full board level. And I would say that it's a term that it's created not by the author's office, because that was what we clarified too. It's, it's other folks, but he is promoting this um, through this resolution. Um, any other comments from the board or questions? Public comment. Uh, Joe Linda Crow from CPA. Just <clears throat> for the board's information, um, CPA has talked extensively with the author's office, and um, they they did completely understand um, after our conversations, and I'm sure the staff here talked to them as well, that including references to uh, the DSM-5 or suggesting that this would be a new mental health disorder in some formal way was um, not what they intended. Um, and, and just to what you said, Ms. Jones, the, as our understanding is that this, was, this is a very real concern from communities of color who are really wanting to raise the awareness of the adverse effects of growing up in some of these communities where there is um, uh, violence. And um, so we, we, have, we feel like we've worked with them quite a while. And uh, CPA now has a neutral position on, on this uh, resolution, and it is important to know it's a resolution. But I, it was—I think it's really with the with the intent of raising awareness to the impact that um, some of these experiences uh, kids have in these communities, um, um, and and the importance of just recognizing that it does have an impact on the kids. And you're right; the term uh, apparently was developed uh, inside. Um, sort of these communities as a response to 
PTSD mm -hmm. with just a, a little twist on PTSD was sort of the same idea in mind that that sometimes uh, they have there's a lasting effect. So we have a neutral position. Thank you, Dr. Jolinda Crow, and I would encourage all the board members just to Google that term because you could see, and I think it was an issue about over, overcoming the stigma. And, yes. And, and so I think that there's there's more to it. It, it wasn't to create a diagnosis and um, a category, and that was my understanding as well. So right, uh, there was original language that yes. actually referred to that, but they un they quickly removed that reference. And so we're, we're neutral on the bill now. And thank you, Ms. Levy, because I know that on the, on the conference call, she provided a lot of information. So thank you for that update from CPA, Dr. Linda Crow. Um, any other board member comments? I just wanted to add, I was at a, a clinic's event last night, medical clinic, and um, they informed me that there's actual data, and you all may have know this already, that, has, that they're collecting that shows that children, especially in these minority communities that are uh, exposed to early trauma, it reduces your lifespan. And so I just found that, you know, interesting that they're beginning to form even like these coalitions. So I just happen to think that this level of awareness and things like that is more tied into what's going on right now, just in the overall medical community as well. Thank you, Ms. Bernal. Dr. Phillips? And I would just also say that um, working in the field of criminal forensics as part of my practice, that a substantial proportion of people in the criminal justice system that come from communities of color or from low-income communities are exposed to these types of things, and it does have very substantial impacts on people's emotional well-being. So again, um, I don't know if anyone has any other comments or questions, so this will continue to stay on the watch is, is the recommendation for staff. Um, unless someone else has an, another idea on any action we need to take as a board. Hearing none, we'll move on. Um, but thank you, I just wanna say thank you to Ms. Burns um, also and, and Mr. Glassbeagle, because I know that they've been in communication on this one, because I know initially when um, Dr. Erickson and I discussed this at our committee meeting, we, we had some, con some concerns and some questions. So thanks for getting all the answers. Um, so I will take us back to the beginning of Section 3, the watch bills, as we've done in the last couple of meetings. We're not going to go through individual ones. We pulled out these two that we've just discussed, XX and ZZ, um, because of the previous conversations about them. But is there any other questions about the watch bills before we leave this agenda item? Hearing none, we'll go back to um, 12... B2, or do we feel like we need a break? It's up to you. Well, we can take a board, do we need a break? Okay, we'll take a 10 minute break. It's 10.22, so can we get back at 10.32? Thank you. <laughs> 